Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, tgstore.co.uk. The home of Gore Bike Wear, Gore Running Wear and Aquasphere Wetsuits. You can get 10% off with the code OXYGENADDICT10 and you can win a Gore Bike or a Gore Run Jacket at tgstore.co.uk forward slash Oxygen Addict. We're also brought to you by PrecisionHydration.com. Leaders in triathlete sweat testing and hydration with multi-strength electrolytes that match how you sweat. There's a 15% off with the code OxygenAddict15. And we've also got Tribe Natural Sports Nutrition at wearetribe.co. Natural Sports Nutrition delivered direct to you. You can get a free trial pack of six delicious energy bars, trail mix, recovery bars and shakes for just a pound by using the code OxygenAddict. Awesome stuff and welcome to the show. We're really excited to bring it to you this week. Later on coming up, we've got an interview with uh, young American professional Drew Scott. But before that, hello, Hells. How are you, my friend? It's lovely to talk to you again. Rob, hello. It seems longer than a week this time. It does somehow, doesn't it? It seems a long time, yeah. Could you feel in your heart that I was away in a different continent for a week? (laughs) No. Where we stretched apart like, like that girl in the Golden Compass and her little pet. (laughs) <laughs> no it won't make any sense if you know that no it's just been a long week for you I did, come on I'm trying to make a connection here Hells. <laughs> work with me I think no um, I, I don't know maybe it's a bank holiday weekend which we've had in the UK here which always is maybe amazing that's it. But yeah it does leave you a bit confused doesn't it and we've had a few recently and we recorded early last week and it's Tuesday this week that's why so it's more than a week for us in our little brains isn't it there you go that explains it all yeah <laughs> Happy Ben, you have a nice weekend. It's a great weekend. Yeah, I went to the Lake District and um, nice. watched the Banff Mountain Film Festival again, which is just it's just brilliant. It's so inspiring. I loved it. Oh, so that was really on, cool. Is it over now? Um no, there's a few more it's obviously not I don't think it's in the Lake District anymore, but there's probably a couple more showings this year. So um if you can get to it, go. Oh, to go it's that, really yeah. cool. They're they're such good little films. They showed one of Danny McCaskill's um films. They showed the one that I saw. There was one about four mums from Yorkshire who rode across the Atlantic. That was super Superbly inspiring. I loved it. Wow. And then like a teenage climber from America. She's sort of Japanese um, descent and she's breaking records all over the world. And she's only like 14, 15 years old. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And doing the hardest routes and just watching videos of her. It was amazing what she could do. (laughs) It was incredible. I love that. So yeah, it sounds like an amazing um, amazing festival. Yeah, and then went for a little run around Derwent Water. Oh, I love Derwent Water. Did you do the whole thing? Yeah. Oh, it's ace, isn't it? Yeah, it's really cool. And the sun shone. Oh, can't get better. When the when you're in the lakes and the sun's shining, and if there's not too many people there, absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. So that was cracking. That was a real cracking sort of 24 hours away. It was great. Oh, good. I'm glad you had a good one, mate. There you go. You've been, where, where have you been? I have been to America, as a few people have commented on the old Facebook photos. Had a flying visit to America for five days to, believe it or not, to go and study with Mark Allen, six-time world champion, greatest triathlete ever to live, etc. Mark Allen. Um, and, you know, I thought I saw this seminar advertised and I thought, I'd really love to do that. And then I just thought, well, why not? Get off your backside and book a plane ticket and go and do it. <laughs> So what was it like? Was it pure triathlon stuff or was it a bit different or what well, What did it all involve? Yeah, the people who know Mark Allen's story will know that he, he really struggled to win Ironman Hawaii despite being recognised as the best triathlete in the world. He had six goes at it and, and kept falling apart in Hawaii. And he started working with a Native American shaman called Brant Secunda or a Huichol Indian shaman who did all kinds of energy healing and stuff with him and mark became converted to this path of spiritual practice which he credits with being the thing that helped him finally win hawaii and he had all kinds of amazing stories about things that had happened and the ways that it affected his training and i mean you know me i've always been really interested in this sort of stuff anyway so their seminar was a combination of kind of fitness and health stuff but combined through the lens of how um 
the Huichol Indian people traditionally grew up, the food that they ate, the way that they walked in nature and lived in nature and like sort of spiritual connection through being in the outdoors in mountains and lakes and things like that. So um, so it was definitely not a, a triathlon performance, power meter focus type weekend at all. And a lot of the people there weren't triathletes. Some of them were, some of them were really good. I met some really nice, um, some really nice triathletes out there actually who were really cool but mainly the focus of it was on this sort of the path of shamanism and how you can connect to your spiritual power through nature which i mean i don't think any of the listeners are going to be surprised to hear me talking about that because i'm always going on about my slightly crazy hippie side aren't i <laughs> the surfing well, rob <laughs> well it's sometimes you know you just come across something and go this is it this is the philosophy that i've been looking for this totally explains x y and z and i just loved it hells it was absolutely brilliant that's there was really lots cool. Of, there was lots of uh, dancing around fires and drumming and things like that going on. So that really? Be, oh yeah, a lot of that. A lot of um, traditional ceremony and things like that that I would never in a million years have imagined myself being interested in taking part in. But it was just brilliant. <laughs> I had such a fun time. And um, and something that people don't realise, I think, Mark Allen is an incredibly humble. Um, I don't know what the phrase is when when somebody just laughs at themselves all the time but he's also very funny he's very relaxed and easy company and and I went kind of imagining that it would be one of those seminars where he'd be on a stage and you wouldn't get to meet him but he sat and ate lunch and dinner and breakfast with everyone and chatted and we went for a run together and I was like I'm running with Mark Allen this is just amazing but he was so down to earth and Brant who was the who was the shaman they had this really cool interplay between them. And every time he introduced Mark Allen, he would be like, and now I'm going to hand you over to Mark Allen, six time world champion and the greatest triathlete and endurance athlete ever the world has seen. And kind of, they'd kind of laugh at each other and at themselves. So there was no sort of taking themselves too seriously, which, which was just really nice. I just laughed the whole weekend. So there's definitely something in that as well. (laughs) A bit like you and me when we get together. (laughs) Did it, open your mind maybe to I don't know different almost training methodologies or wasn't to do with that at all no there was lots of that stuff that Mark talked about and it wasn't that it was necessarily different training strategies but I studied the way that Mark coached in the early days of my coaching career and absorbed a lot of that stuff and people I was mentored by were coached by him so there's a kind of a like a lineage there anyway so Mark's a big believer in lots of steady state training and only sprinkling in um, interval training which is where I get my sort of hard work on the bike and easy work on the swim and run philosophy from it's kind of adapted from those ideas early on so we had really common ground in a lot of areas the one thing that Mark did differently was he said because he came into it having done high intensity exercise training all the time every day he would literally do blocks of six to eight weeks where all he did was sort of steady aerobic or zone two type training and he would monitor his heart rate against pace and then when he saw that was starting to he'd kind of gradually get quicker at a given heart rate for a while and then as it started to plateau he would then introduce some interval work but only in a very limited way so it was dead interesting to hear his perspective as someone who was sounded like he was pretty burnt out on all the really hard training when he started um so yeah, it was it was super it was more interesting to hear how his training philosophy had developed because of how it had affected him across time and it was like, you know, the really early days of the the heart rate monitor when he started doing it, he was talking about how this thing was like the size of a dinner plate that they had to strap onto his chest with like elastic bandages when he went for a run and he couldn't run normally at first because the thing was so heavy um oh my God. that it was bouncing around all over the place. But there's definitely something in, you know, the fact that he was one of the first people to, and, and is sort of, it wasn't a coach, but this guy, Phil Maffetone, who first came up with this yep. idea of aerobic training, he was the first exercise physiologist who did loads of study with, or was credited with doing loads of study with heart rate training. So it's almost like you you go back to the source material and hear it from the horse's mouth. And I think some things have maybe changed since then. And... I think the key is for me to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and go, 
because I came away going, I'm going to do it just like Mark does it. And then I kind of sat down myself and went, well, you've learned a lot of your own stuff as well that seems to work along the way. So don't chuck all of that out. But it's definitely really good to hear somebody else's point of view, especially someone who, you know, Mark Allen, you know, master coach and six time world triathlon champion. So uh, I got loads from it and could happily have stayed at that place, I tell you. <laughs> You have to go back, Rob. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to, definitely. I'm going to... They do this course, which is like the... It was like two days spread over three days, like a Friday evening, all day Saturday, and half of Sunday. And then they do like five and seven day retreats. And I'm really, really seriously looking at going on one of their big retreats later on in the year because I just found the whole thing so brilliant. It's like the Rob Wilby equivalent of a triathlon training camp, isn't it? totally that's exactly what it was well you know people use that word retreat and I've always heard it and thought well what happens there you have a massage and sit down for a bit but I came back from this place just so energetic and excited about life you know <laughs> I'm going to show really up cool. now before I drive people crazy people are probably driving in the cars going I hate this idiot stop talking about retreats <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shall we shall we move on to some results, Rob? We'll move on to some results, yeah. But I tell you what, I'm trying to get Mark and Brandt to come over to the UK to do one of their seminars here. So if anybody's interested in it, watch this space. It won't be this year, but hopefully next year. Maybe we'll have some listeners there with us, Hells, next year. Would you come? Would you come and do something like that? Would you be interested in it? Uh, like initially, kind of... Sorry, I sound really like, I don't know. Um... Yeah, I probably I would be interested in just a completely different perspective on things. I think from yeah, my point of really view, um, and possibly a get away from the manicness and the routine. I think that's what I would enjoy about it, and going in there with a very open mind. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely um, some open mindedness needed for sure. But, no question. Yeah. But equally, if, and this is the more practical side of things, you know, if I only had X number of weeks leave, then I wouldn't mind spending a week kind of like we're going to do this year, going cycling, cycle touring. And in a way, that's my way of yeah, sure. kind of escapism. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. But who knows, though? Maybe in time, maybe you'll come yeah. to it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. There you go. <sighs> right, shall we do some... So what are we on to next? I've got all excited talking about Mark and Brands and I've completely forgotten where we are. We need some, some results, don't we? <laughs> do results <laughs> brought to you by tgstore.co.uk and uh, don't forget you can get 10% off with the code OxygenAddict10. And um, I know last week we mentioned all of their um, their spring wear, didn't we? Um, but they've also got some rather beautiful uh, run collection out at the moment as well. So Helen, it is go... that time of year when a man's thoughts turn to new running shorts and t-shirts, isn't it? Probably ladies too. I found myself today looking at my frankly moth-eaten eight-year-old adidas knee-length shorts and thinking do you know it might just be time to replace these this season that is exactly it so they've got some really really cool vests and shorts and and anything that you probably want for your summer running wardrobe which doesn't involve long sleeve tops <laughs> it's hard to believe that the summer's here isn't it we've had continuous warm weather for a while it's great to get out and uh yeah, I've got my eye on the Mythos race shorts, Helen. I quite like the look of those. Because I'm not a man, as you know, I'm not a man who wears those kind of skimpy, split up the side, three inch long, almost budgie smuggler type running shorts. I'm a, I'm a knee length running short man. And they've got several pairs in it. So I've got my eye on the Mythos race shorts or the, even the essential baggy shorts might be the way for me. Maybe even a bit of baggy, Helen. I love it. Well, Oh, I'm all over the sunlight range, which is just like colourful prints, really cool, funky, funky prints. Um, you know, everyone loves my yeah. orange shorts, so uh, maybe I could get another pair of like crazy, crazy run shorts. Or do they have, now I'm going out on a limb here, Hells, do they oh. have anything that would actually coordinate with any of your running tops? <laughs> Probably like a black, <laughs> you know, something plain and black. <laughs> <laughs> Far be it for me to suggest the idea of colour coordination in your running kit. But that is one of your trademarks, isn't it? The orange shorts. Sometimes I have been known to wear my orange shorts with a green, bright green nice. T-shirt. Love it. 
celebrating all the colours of the rainbow. It's quite vile, but hey, I'm not missed. <laughs> So anyway, anyway, if you're after some new running kit this year, get yourself over and have a look at either the uh, the shorts or vests or t-shirts or whatever over at the tgstore.co.uk and buy from the people who support the show that you love. That'd be awesome. Cool. So, Rob, let's start in Spain because um, it was the European Duathlon Championship, sprint distance and standard distance. Um, and obviously GB tend to send a big age group team out there. And the big... I think the big result of the weekend yeah, was definitely. that Jackie Phillips, um, who was in the 50 to 54 age group, um, won the overall sprint distance age group race. That is awesome. She's a rock star, isn't she? Yep. <laughs> really is nuts. Just goes to show, guys, you can keep on getting faster all the way into your 50s. Imagine being overall European champion. Yeah, so absolutely fantastic. Um, so in total, GB won uh, 11 golds in the sprint, 12 silvers and 14 bronzes. Uh, and then in the standard distance, um, there were 11 golds, um, 10 silvers and 8 bronzes. So as ever, a really good showing for the GB age group team out at the European Duathlon Championships in Spain. So congratulations to um, everyone who competed. And if you want to see a whole list of the names of the Team GB medal winners, then check it out on try247.com. Yeah, cool. Right, over to Taiwan for Challenge and Half Challenge Taiwan. Shall we start with should we start with the half challenge distance to start with? Yes, I think we should, Rob. Um yeah, let's do let's do the half. Um so basically um Jan Fredino was a bit of a late addition to the half challenge oh, Taiwan event. To Taiwan, no messing about there. No. So he did a he he'd finished in three forty eight, a twenty two fifty one swim, two oh three on the bike, and then a one fourteen run. And he said that the course has got some of the smoothest fastest roads in the world maybe second only to roth wow that's scorching when he was so far ahead of everybody else as well isn't it yeah so his coach told him to keep pushing on the run but 114 running on your own as a time trial off the back of a 203 bike split is pretty special isn't it totally so yeah a bit like brownlee the other day absolutely dominating a um, challenge gran canaria didn't he the half challenge gran canaria so similar you know go and get get yourself a massive confidence boosting result in a slightly smaller field and show you know put a marker down basically yeah yeah and continue to put the fear of god into all your rivals hey totally, totally. where did he announce he's racing this summer was it austria yes oh, do you know what that could be blisteringly fast <laughs> I'm just I'm doing the maths in my head. Is he already the official? He's not the official Ironman world record holder, is he? He did his time at Roth. Mm-hmm. And is it Lionel Sanders who's the official? It is. I'm right in that, aren't I? Lionel Sanders is the official Ironman record holder. So maybe he's going to Austria to try and claw that as well. Because that was always mm-hmm. like where the, where the fast... Marino went like 740 something there, I think, didn't he? Yeah. Low 740s. Yep. So it's not out of the realms of possibility that Fredino will go in the 730s there if he's in good shape. Ah, oh, exciting times. <laughs> it's really cool. Really, really cool. And then in the um, in the full distance race, um, Rob, uh, it was uh, Sweden's Freddy Kronenberg uh, won for the second time, actually. Uh, he finished in 803 ahead of um, Dougal Allen and Guy Crawford, both of New Zealand, in second and third. And then in the women's race, it was won by Verena Walter of Germany in 9.25. Lucy Zelenkova was second, and New Zealand's Catherine Hazener a third in 9.46. Right, next up then, we should look forward, shouldn't we, to this coming weekend, because there's a couple of big races coming up, and the biggest one of those is Ironman 70.3 St. George in Utah, which is the North American Championship for pros. So... Lots of pennies and lots of points on the line and a particular interest for us, but also I think for pretty much everyone with a triathlon heartbeat in the world, is the three-way head-to-head going on at the head of this field. Lionel Sanders, Seb Keenley and Ali Brownlee all on the same start line together. All of them in decent shape. 
What do you think, Hells? I'm going to go for Brownlee. Really? Yep. I, d- I just don't think I can call it. Well, I didn't want to, but you made me, so well, I'm putting yeah. it out there. Alice Brownlee, it's going to be awesome. So let's work out how it's going to go down. Al is going to come out in the front pack of the swim, so he'll have a gap on Seb Keenley already, and he'll definitely have a gap on Lionel Sanders, right? Yep. But he can ride. So the question is, is he going to let Seb Keenley and then Lionel Sanders catch him, and the three of them will ride together? Will they all try and kill each other? Will it then come down to a running yes, race? Yes, I think that one. <laughs> will it then... Because Seb Keenley is definitely going to have to try and put time into Sanders and Brownlee. There's no question in his head, is there? No. So, and Alistair Brownlee's got the cycling, and of course, so is Lionel Sanders. They've got the horsepower to hang on to the surges in a way that probably no other two triathletes have in the world. So the three of them might kill each other and they might not even be able to run at the end of it. <laughs> in which case, then you can sort of say, hello, Tim Don, hello, Ben Hoffman, you know? <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, looking down the list, you've also got, what, Brent McMahon, Joe Gambles, Kevin Collins and Trevor Wirtel. Kyle Buckingham, Domenico Pasuelo's on there as well. He can ride Max Rabot. So there's a really deep field. Mark Buckingham's down there, so he can seriously run. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to be great. So that one will be really, really fun to uh, to follow, won't it? Did you say that's on Saturday? It yeah. Is, isn't it? Right, we'll yeah. have to watch that then. Yeah, so follow that one. And then the the women's race, Rob, there's been a bit of an update in that um, Heather Wirtel has uh, dropped out because of injury. So current... 70.3 world champion Holly Lawrence is probably goes into that one as um, race favourite. It's hard to see anybody getting near her, isn't it, in the form that she's in with her with her pedigree. Ali Salthouse is in good form. Um, yeah. Obviously, Rachel Joyce is she's really just returning to it, isn't she? She had one race so far, or has she even had yep. two? Just she was the one. seventh, wasn't she? Yeah. So yeah. it's I mean, with full respect to her, it's it's hard to uh, see her troubling Holly Lawrence in the form that she's in, but it'll be interesting to see how much more of a, an inroad she's made because if she can get back to the form that she used to be in, then you've got game totally. on on the swim and bike, haven't you, at the very least. Totally. So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be great. So look out for that one on um, Saturday. And then um, there's another Ironman, isn't there? The Ironman, uh, yeah, big one as well for our, our down south listeners. Ironman Australia. Which That's is, right. is that Saturday as well? Or is that on the Sunday? I think that on Sunday. On Sunday, yeah. May the 7th, is that Sunday? It is, yeah. But it'll be yeah. either tomorrow or the day after, won't it, for us up here? Or yesterday or correct. tomorrow, as it were. Um, correct. My first correct, ever correct, Ironman, correct. Ironman Australia, Helen, back in the day. 2003. Yes. Used to love that place, I tell you. It's a great oh. race. It's awesome. Um, yeah, so male race participants, it's hard to see anyone taking Tim Reed down. Um, defending, is he defending champion? Is that right? He is, yeah. Yep, correct. We've also got David Dello, Michael Fox, Brad Carlefeld. So Brad Carlefeld on form, Paul Ambrose, Chris McDonald, Pedro Gomez as well. Oh, Nick Baldwin's racing. Brilliant. Hope he goes well. Yeah. Um, yep. But again, it's hard to see past Tim Reed if he turns up in form and, and has a look go his way in the day. And then in the ladies' race. Yeah, it looks, um, uh, Laura Siddle's definitely racing. And um, again, it's hard to look past her, but um, you never know what will happen. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Do you? There's a but, lot of um, luck involved in an Ironman, isn't there? Yeah, totally. So good luck to everyone racing uh, 70.3 St. George, Ironman Australia and um, everywhere else. If you're racing this weekend, I don't know. I know um, quite a few um, people were doing like some more sort of local pool based triathlon still. Um I don't know if they had. Have we had any open water ones yet in the UK? Yeah, there was one near us last weekend. There was that one at Boundary Water Park that loads the gas. Oh, there was, this, wasn't yeah. there? They said it was pretty chilly. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think I might take my first dip this Saturday, Rob. Do you know, Hells, I almost went in this weekend in America. I went in <laughs> up to my knees and I just thought, I was wearing like cargo shorts and a t-shirt and there was no one else around I thought right, I'm going to strip down to my pants and go in and as I thought this this whole bunch of high school students came around the corner and I was like oh thank god I didn't take my shorts off and be arrested <laughs> <laughs> actually we we saw a, we saw a guy in Derwent Water just coming back to his car and um in a wetsuit oh, or... he, he had his wetsuit yeah. there okay. yep. yeah I might have noticed a sort of Iron Man or Outlaw tattoo and I said oh have you been in and um, and he said, 
said yeah but it was so cold he said for the you know i've been doing this now for like five six years he said that it's the first time i've ever had a panic attack oh wow he said it's completely not my confidence it was so cold in there yeah. so uh yeah there you it go is, it's a deep one as well isn't it don't water as well so you want to be i think so you don't yeah want to get in, like coniston or somewhere like that this time of year no honestly there, there was one part on our little run and i thought oh that looks so beautiful i could swim in that bit yeah um there was clearly no way i was getting in there but yeah i might um i think i am gonna pack go packing with my wetsuit on saturday <laughs> yeah, good Good. We should meet up. We should go down to uh, the secret spot and go for a swim together. I'm up for it if you are this weekend. Let's see. I'm working. Ah, oh, okay. I'm off the yeah. hook. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm working. So no, it's all right. You don't. I'm I'm going to go in Salford Keys. There you go. That's where I'm going, and nicely on the doorstep, so oh, I can right. go and have <laughs> I can warm up shower with a shower. <laughs> Coffee. <Yeah. laughs> good for you, mate. Uh, okay. There we go. Right, Rob. This is a good question for Coach's Couch. Um, Alan Prentice got in touch with us, right? And he says, 12 weeks of training until Outlaw Triathlon. How long a run or ride, well, both, you know, should I get up to in my training? Yeah, cool. Um, so I've got a couple of answers here, depending on what, I don't know anything about Alan's background, whether it's his first one or whether he's experienced. And I'm, and I'm going to lead this answer towards the fact it sounds like it's his first iron distance race because of the way he's asking for advice about it. So... Um, what I tend to say to people who are doing their first Ironman is if you can, firstly talking about the ride, if you can get a ride up to 180 kilometers in your legs before race day, that's absolutely brilliant. But my, my, fi- my feeling and finding has been if you ride for more than about six, six and a half hours in training, it can be fairly traumatic on your body. And so if you're someone who's from a really strong cycling background and you're expecting your bikes put on race day to be, you know, 5.15 or 5.30, great. If you can get a six hour bike ride in in training, that's going to be really good aerobic training for you and it's going to give you confidence. But even if you're expecting your bike leg on the day to be seven hours or seven and a half hours, I think that six hour bike leg is the kind of length where you can do it but if you build up to it in enough time you'll also be able to do it again before race day and probably doing two what you consider really long rides is going to be better than just building up and doing one really long one put my teeth in one really long long ride so i think in an ideal world you get to the point where you do a really long ride of six hours say four weeks out from your race and also two weeks out from your race if you're a beginner and that'll give you that confidence that you've done it once and then you've done it again and don't worry about the fact if you only cover you know whatever the distance is in training it is going to be shorter because the the cumulative impact of traffic lights and stops and checking the map and all of that stuff has a massive effect on how far you travel in training and you will go cumulatively much faster on race day so don't worry about that quite so much but if you can get a six hour bike ride or ideally two six hour bike rides in the bag before race day that'll give you the confidence going forward i think now in terms of runs and especially this is tailored advice to people who are slower on the run if you're expecting your ironman run to take four and a half five and a half six hours on race day it's tempting to think well I need to go out and run for that long in training to prepare for it. But again, what we found is anything more than about two and a half to maybe three hours maximum in training is incredibly difficult to recover from. And you'll end your entire next week by trying to run more than certainly more than three hours and probably more than about two and a half hours. So in an ideal world, you're going to get to the point where you can run that two and a half hour distance, let's say four weeks or five weeks out from race day, and then do it two or three times every week before you get to race day and then have a little taper off for the last 10 days. And by doing that repeatedly, you'll get that durability aspect of training where you'll recover week in and week out and improve your fitness. Whereas if you try and go out and do a really super long 23 mile run and it's taking you four and a half, five hours, you just might not be able to do anything for the next four or five days. Um, In the early days and and 12 weeks out, it still is the early days, a real good way to get in some endurance training on your feet is to do your long run midweek, so on a Wednesday or a Thursday, do your long ride on a Saturday and then on a Sunday go out for a walk with your family and when they sit down to have a picnic you stay on your feet and try and be on your feet for 
whatever your expected duration is going to be. Because I'll always remember my old physiology professor saying when we were talking about marathon training, for a lot of people, just being on your feet for that period of time is a physiological stress that nobody in the modern world ever does. You know, it's not like we stand up in our office jobs. It's not like we walk around the savannah trying to hunt down <laughs> wild boar or whatever, which our ancestors used to, but we just don't. So if you go out for a long walk and resist the temptation to sit down when other people have a break, you can be on your feet then for three, four, five, six hours in a way that will help build endurance, but won't completely wreck your running muscles for the rest of the week. And that I think is probably the safest way for people who are new to it to build up and ultimately the safety of doing it in a way that people don't get injured is what's going to give them the longevity to be able to go on and do this sport and probably to train for this thing successfully so yeah there we go six hours on the bike two and a half on the run plus some really long walks that's my that's my ballpark but if you've got any direct questions alan if you fire them over to help oxygenaddict.com i'm happy to help you out mate rob how are things with oxygen addict Really good, thanks. Yeah, really, really good. We've got, well, it's exciting because we're getting into race season now and people are starting to do, we've had the first few team members who are, we've got people all over the world. So we've had people race in Australia and they've had their A race and they've, it's quite weird actually because they've gone back into their winter training, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but most people are entering into their sort of race season and there's a lot of people racing in Lanzarote in a couple of weeks is the first really big race so they've already done their 70.3 in preparation for it and they've got I think three weeks to Lanzarote from now um so yeah excited to see how they go um it's just lovely the way everyone chats together in the Facebook group and g's each other up and gives them it's a bit like our our tri-club forum hells there's such a nice bunch of people in there and it's I'm just so happy with how it's worked out I'm really really lucky and I think I got an email off someone this week who I used to teach with who's having a really hard time. And I just think I'm so lucky that I got out of that into a job that I now enjoy probably even more than I ever did when I was at the peak of enjoyment of teaching. So uh, I consider myself very lucky. That's awesome. I'm going to be wearing the kit, Rob, at um, Outlaw Half. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Yeah, I am. I've tried it on. How does it look? The new Is this the new Team Oxygen Addict slinky skin suit? Yeah. Does God, it, you've got to breathe in, haven't you? Does it look super <laughs> suit? Yeah, it's second skin, isn't it? It's like, oh, and breathe. Yeah. Um, I think it looks okay. I mean, God, I'm fairly pasty, but, you know. The thing um, to get your black. head around is the, is the tightness of it and the fact that it will yeah. feel really comfortable when you're moving in it. But when you put it on in the bedroom the first time, do you do that thing where you got up it's around your waist like... and went... This is the size of my five-year-old child. <laughs> no, because I don't on? have a five-year-old child. But I did get into it, and I thought, oh my God, this is small. And yeah. then I also thought, I sent you a photo, didn't I, of um, me in 2004 before my first yeah, London Marathon. Oh. Yeah, I don't think I would have fitted into it. So <laughs> I, I had no idea. Ripped. I had. So, so for the listeners who haven't met Helen, Helen is really sort of lean marathon runner kind of build now and i i met you and you were a lean runner marathon build but you didn't used to be did you well i think it was sort of uni time and probably too much socializing and i i think this particular photo is a bad photo fo- was a bad photo but i looked like a I, no i didn't look like a lean mean you've come a long way kid machine. that's for sure you've changed your life mate i was so proud looking at that and going wow yeah yeah it's mad isn't it have you been out on the bike yet in your skin suit have you you dared to try it out that'll be an interesting ride for you because you'll have that do you remember how matt bottrell talked about feeling the air on your body like swimmers feel the air oh yeah go out and give it a try on your tri bike because all of a sudden you'll be going these gloves are really baggy I thought that sounds really stupid. I was like, I could feel the wind as a contrast to how it was around my body, right? I could feel the wind catching in like the little finger holes of my of my mitts on my bike, which I'd never experienced oh, before. And I was like, I've become really aware of how the air's moving around me. And that's exactly what Matt talks about is just consciously thinking all the time of where the air is and trying to make himself smaller, which I don't think is necessarily the be all and end all for triathlete but you definitely get free speed from doing it and the suit will really help um highlight that for you well i may be experimenting later this week rob because the weather is good isn't it the weather's quite nice yeah and because i'm working 
uh, this weekend. I have a little day off in the week, so I'm thinking of doing my long ride. So, Brilliant. Um, yeah, I might might try it out. <laughs> yeah, good for you. Send yeah. a photo. I want to see a photo of you in resplendent oh, in your God. new kit. Okay, I'll keep you posted on that one. Right, Rob, let's move on to uh, news, which is sponsored by Tribe Nutrition. And don't forget that you can, which I did at the weekend, actually, Rob, you can sign up, basically, and you can get a mixture of six sort of nutritional goodies. So it might be energy bars or recovery bars or shakes or trail mix for one pound if you use the code oxygen addict so they should be arriving through the letterbox over the next day or two so that's quite exciting anyway first one rob hang on before we we do that we need to give people a push for this right because this right here is a no-brainer six energy bars for a quid and they are super delicious and all organic and such a big fan of the product so do that and it comes in a slinky little package that comes through the letterbox the thought of everything it's a letterbox sized packet isn't it yeah, you don't have to go back to the post office and exactly. go, oh, what a nightmare. When am I going to get to the post office? Don't need that. Energy bars through the door. So get on that for a pound. You can get yourself. And they also have a thing you can then set up if you like it, like a recurring monthly or two weekly or two monthly delivery of stuff, which is like Tesco's online, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's a no-brainer. Yeah, but for, no for sports brainer. nutrition. So they are, we are tribe dot co yeah and um do you know what we're gonna have guy from tribe on the show in a couple of weeks time because he's got such a cool story how they started the company and um they're doing him and his company and a thousand other people are doing a duathlon to raise a million pounds to help prevent people trafficking they're doing a where was it from oh i can't remember the details like i think croatia to london Oh, wow. A continuous duathlon type thing. So I want to hear all about it from the horse's mouth because it sounds like one of those. They're so socially conscious, you know what I mean? Mm. So, yeah. Anyway, listeners, get on there. Get yourself delicious snacks. If that's all you get out of it, then it's a winner for a pound, isn't it? I think so. I will. Yeah. I, I'm hoping it might fuel us through um, through Italy, Rob, next month. Um, Definitely. Anyway, the news. Um, first thing is... Like if you're listening to this quite soon after we put it up and release it and you fancy trying to do the London Marathon in 2018, well, then you can go and enter the ballot until 5 p.m. UK time on Friday, the 5th of May. Um, and if you're overseas as well, again, they have an overseas ballot and again, it's only open until 5 p.m. UK time on Friday, the 5th of May. So Virgin Money, LondonMarathon.com, and you'll find it there. So if you fancy it, give it a go. You probably won't get in. I'm in hell. I'm in the ballot. Are you? I am in. If I get in, I'm doing it again next year, I've decided. Excellent. I'm inspired Excellent. by your I love story. It. Yeah. Next bit of news then, the Brownlee Centre opens up in up in Leeds, performance centre for triathlon, cycling, all kinds of team sports as well, has opened in their name, hasn't it? It looks really cool. It does look very cool. So it's at the University of Leeds and it's um, it's got a one-mile cycle circuit, which is quite cool. It's got a training suite and then physiotherapy, medical services, and they're basically saying that it's going to be world class world-class facilities in that region yeah and it was named after um ali and johnny so the brownie center so that's very cool and then rob the other bit of news which i saw which i i saw this um late last week and i thought oh rob will be interested in this yeah because we've mentioned it before fred witten challenge has partnered with um the tour de france owners yeah it's amazing isn't it what a recognition of their of their having built an event from a bunch of mates in the Lake District doing an event in somebody's honour to being bought out by ASO or partnered with ASO to help them organise it because I think they will, them and, and Human Race will help take that to an even bigger global audience, won't they? Because it is one of the most unbelievable bike rides in the whole world. It's just fantastic. Yeah, so it's going to be on the Bike Channel um, in 2017, because uh, it's this weekend actually, Rob, yeah, the Fred Witten. Right. So nice yeah, for it. yeah. So because of because of joining up with Human Race, yeah, it will be on TV, which is really cool. Um, and now 
I think it's gone from being like a thousand people participating to over two and a half thousand. So um, well done to the, uh, the the Saddleback Fred Witten Challenge original people yeah. and the Lakes Road Club. Yeah, awesome stuff. Right, let's go into this week's interview. This week we've got a treat for you. Our interview is sponsored by Precision Hydration. And so what we'd like you guys to do is you can uh, you can have a free triathlon sweat test that gives you a personalized hydration plan tailored to the distance of triathlon that you're training for. There'll be a link to it in the show notes. Um, it's basically precisionhydration.com forward slash pages forward slash triathlon oh and there's all kinds of code and stuff so go to our go to the thing in itunes or on our website there's a, a link to click through but it will actually give you your personalized hydration needs based on a bunch of questions that they ask you and it's really really very clever now anyone who takes the sweat test via us via that link before midnight on sunday the 14th of may is entered into a draw to win the personal one-to-one hydration sorry the personalized hydration bundle so loads of precision hydration salts and stuff worth 50 quid so you get yourself on there and they're going to share the information with the show afterwards so we can tell you all about how the range of listeners sweat so get over there to precisionhydration.com and you can check out all the range of electrolyte salts and stuff that they've got with it being hot weather at the moment as well so get yourself some goodies there to help protect your training through the summer months so this week's interview hells is with drew scott drew scott Son of Ironman legend Dave Scott, he turned pro a couple of years ago, and I've got to say, Helen, I had such a laugh doing this interview. I did this one over video, and um, he's such a nice guy. He's so f- like friendly and smiley and happy, and um, I was so glad we had the video on because he kept laughing all the way through it, and we had a really good giggle doing it. So he's had some bad injury problems and accidents and stuff recently, so hopefully he'll be back to full power soon, but we've got a great interview with him here. All right, so Drew Scott, welcome. Thank you very much for agreeing to join us on the Oxygen Addict Triathlon podcast. All the way over from, is it sunny Boulder or have you still got snow on the ground over there? Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, we've had some, some really nice weather the last week. So it's, yeah, sunny and 70s the last probably 10 days or so. So it's been pretty good. Can't, can't complain. Oh, not jealous here at all. We've had like torrential rain and downpours. It's been the Easter weekend and it's been a total washout over here, man. <laughs> Ooh. I was looking at some photos on your blog earlier of you of you hiking up some mountains and it looks like you've just got some totally amazing scenery over there in Boulder. Yeah, it's pretty uh I guess I've kind of taken it for granted growing up here, but um no, there's there's plenty of you know, trekking up in the mountains, skiing, uh, you know, mountain biking. But uh yeah, I think uh I don't know what photos you saw, but um yeah, there's plenty of Plenty of options, you know, five, ten minutes out of town. Would and... it have been Bear Mountain? Have I remembered that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it, maybe that was one I did with my, my dad. Uh, yeah. So Bear Mountain is right in town there. And, and nice. I actually don't don't get up there as much as I'd like. But uh, every time I do, you know, you can kind of get lost for five hours trekking around up in the mountains. And, I mean, you're never that far from Boulder there, really. But uh, to, uh change it up a bit and get up in the hills every once in a while yeah there you go huh? it looked amazing anyway so listen we wanted to get you on the show we've been we've been really lucky here i'll give the listeners a bit of background um your coach matt dixon has hooked us up for the interview matt's been great about basically i think forcing all you guys into doing an interview with us it's probably it's a fine print when yeah you man know strong armed into an interview which is great <laughs> but i'm dead excited to have you on because what we've got here is is like the the story of the neo pro developing from having been like top age group triathlete to stepping into the pro world to having like some injury stuff going on and and we can talk a little bit about that hopefully and then yeah. getting some real success in the pro world as well and then recently some real bad luck unfortunately so yeah. you know we'll get onto that but let's let's go back to the start how did you how did you start off becoming involved in triathlon um, well, I, obviously when I was, uh, a little, little kid growing up, I, I didn't know too much about it, but, uh, my dad was, was obviously racing and, and, uh, kind of dabbled in, you know, all sorts of sports as most kids do. And I played soccer for 10 years when I was young and, you know, we were, we were swimming a bit. My mom was a, a swim coach, so she sort of taught us a summer league swimming growing up and, 
um, sort of just progressed doing a little bit of sports and running and in, in middle school, I, I ran track and cross country in high school. Um, it wasn't until, you know, I really didn't do my first uh, triathlon until, I want to say it was 2007, and it was a local, um, so I was uh, 16, 17, and, and it was a local, uh, just Olympic distance triathlon that, that actually volunteered at a year prior and and decided to jump in. And I, I'd done a few when I was really young, just kids triathlons, yeah. one or two, so um, you know, I certainly knew about the sport and, and I was always, you know, ever since when I was growing up, I was always following all the stats and, you know, I was following races, just any sort of sports, you know, when I was seven years old, I'm reading the sports page every day, you know, yeah. before school. And, um, so yeah, I, I jumped in uh, a local race in the summer and then I, I kind of did that same race, the, the Boulder Peak Triathlon for a couple summers, um, before really making the jump into triathlon. I was still Nordic skiing at the time. Um, so I, I Nordic skied for, for 10 years um, through my first two years of university uh, up at Montana State and then kind of got the triathlon bug after dipping my feet in uh, during the summer and decided uh, that I wanted to kind of make a shift to, to racing triathlons um, and sort of put skiing on the back burner for a bit. You must have been uh, you must have been concerned about your knees at times, man, with the with the Nordic skiing, huh? Is it like uh, a? Well, you know, it's probably not as hard on you as you know the Alpine, you know, where you're doing slalom or something. But oh, I suppose uh, so. No, no, Nordic. Yes, yeah, Nordic cross country skiing. So we'd race, you know, both the classic and skate technique, and and I initially picked it up. My brother did it for a year, so I picked it up when I was ten, and we had some neighbors that that were sort of in charge of the junior team, and. They introduced us, and um, just I kept doing it throughout middle school, high school, and and then into college. And uh, it's it's definitely it's a brutal sport. I mean, it's yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's you really. Uh, I'll say it's a different kind of suffering to to triathlon, but uh, for anyone that's done it, it's um, yeah, it's a great. You know, you're you're using everything, so it's a great great workout. And um, I kind of wish I I did it more these days, but I it's uh, I never find the time to get up too often, but uh, yeah, it was a good, uh, yeah, I met a lot of good people racing in Nordic skiing and, um, I think it probably didn't hurt, hurt my engine at all for, for triathlon. So, well, they do say, don't they, that there's probably no better sport for like all around aerobic development than, than the cross country ski, Nordic skiing type stuff. It's just like an incredibly brutal workout on all levels, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, they always have those, uh, stats you read about the highest, you know, VO2 max ever yeah. recorded as. Uh, I don't know Bjorn Dolly or some some Norwegian uh, skiers. So, yeah, you get uh, yeah you get the full full range there, and and it's always fun to you know I still watch the World Cup skiing and and still follow the you know my friends that are still racing. Um, so you always it's, get it's the impression, don't you? The end of those races, the guys just look beyond whipped. They just fall yeah. over, and you think they're just completely gone for two or three minutes at the end of it. It's yeah. like nothing you ever see in track athletics. Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, a lot of the athletes are racing, again, you have sort of sprint specialists, you know, that are racing a 1K event, um, where you then go through rounds, so you're maybe having to race basically a 1K all-out effort for, you know, four times in one day, um, but then all the way up to the 50K uh, at wow. the Olympics, and some of the guys are pretty, um, yeah, they're able to race, you know, the whole range, and, and they do do quite well across across the whole spectrum, so it's but yeah, it's it's a brutal it's a brutal sport. <laughs> so you're probably the only person who came into triathlon thinking, oh, this is a bit of a break. Actually, this is a bit easier than the uh, usual <laughs> sport. <laughs> well, I was I was always kind of a scrawny guy growing up, so I, you know everyone always gave me a hard time. And, and uh, I think my freshman year of high school, I was not even five feet tall, and I, I don't even know if I weighed 100 pounds. So I uh, really? I was the scrawny guy. And, wow. And most of the Nordic skiers, you know, for people that have watched it, they're all pretty you know, pretty buff, pretty and, beefy. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. You've got to have some, some real upper body strength on you. So that was, that was maybe my, my one downside is Nordic skiing. You know, I think, I think I had a pretty good engine, but maybe never quite got as, uh, yeah, as beefy as I needed to be to really <laughs> uh, produce that power. So, uh, and how I tried, was the, tried. <laughs> sorry, how was the transition into triathlon for you then in that first race? Did success come easily to you straight away? Um, yeah. So I, you know, I would get back, I would basically drive, you know, home for the summer after, after Nordic skiing, basically we'd be racing through, you know, the end of March and I'd get home. And then, you know, after that I would start to run a bit up in, up in Bozeman, uh, spring weather there is still pretty, 
pretty lousy. So it's yeah. still snowing some. And, um, and then I'd get to Boulder in May and that's sort of the first time I would start swimming. So, um, and obviously I'd swam summer league, so I knew how to swim, but that was probably my least favorite of the three when I jumped in. So really I was just biking and, and, and running, uh, I guess leading into that first race. And, um, I, you know, I did well, certainly my, my bike was a strength. My run and swim were pretty lousy. I'll say that first one. So I, <laughs> I suffered like crazy for it on the 10 K 10 K run and, you know, blew up something terrible, but, uh, yeah, it certainly, I don't know. It, it was, I guess it was kind of fun. Cause I come back home and, you know, you'd see progress. I would just start riding, you know, for the first time in eight months or whatever. And so, you know, every week I'm getting faster and faster and I get to the end of the summer, uh, finally do this race. And I say, Oh, you know, now I've got to stop for eight more months. And I, you know, I go up to Bozeman <laughs> and I sort of switch my focus to, to Nordic skiing. And, and, um, yeah, it was hard. Cause I mean, a lot of the Nordic skiers, you know, you've got to be roller skiing i don't know i don't know if you've seen those things but it's you know yeah. it's almost like roller blades but they're longer so you know everyone's doing that in the summer and uh, i can't say i was ever a huge fan of that so <laughs> I, I would much prefer to be on my bike and um you know moving a bit quicker so yeah i would just kind of transition for you know the three months that i was back home and 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 then i would stop for and i guess i did that for the two years uh that i was up still still racing uh at montana state so. Okay, and then yeah. having had a look on your your website, that the first result you've got up there, which there's got to be a story behind this, your your first race that's listed is Hawaii, doing Ironman Hawaii <laughs> as an age grouper in in 2011, um, and it says with two flats and a broken hand. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So that I mean that wasn't my obviously my, not my first race, but no, sure, so 2000, but yeah. 2011 was the first year when I, uh, I guess the the winter of 2011 was, or sorry, that spring is when I finished up Nordic skiing and made the decision that I was going to transfer back to University of Colorado and in and, and Boulder and and sort of give triathlon a, a shot. So um, that summer, I guess, was my first summer where I was, you know, kind of more focused uh, on racing. And I just happened to qualify for Kona um, at Buffalo Springs 70.3 in, in Lubbock, Texas. So uh, they they have they had slots back then, and I suppose it was a bit of a sneaky way to get into Kona, and <laughs> some people might frown upon that. But uh, so, anyways, I I qualified there, and it was a brutal. You know, they had some they have some brutal heat down there, so it was it was a hot day, and um, I just kind of I wasn't even thinking about going to Kona. That wasn't you know I just started racing kind of, and uh, but you know, my dad was down there and, and I just kind of decided, I was like, Oh, well, you know, why not? You know, I, I qualified, you know, let's, I'll give it a whirl and and see what happens. So, uh, I did a few more, I did a local, you know, the Boulder 70.3 that summer, a couple other shorter races, um, leading in. And then, uh, two weeks before the race, uh, at the time my dad was coaching Chrissy Wellington and, and I was riding some with, with her and, and, uh, her husband, Tom, and we were out on sort of the last long ride before, you know, yeah, two weeks out from Kona. And when she crashed, I, I was with them and sort of was on the outside of her. So when she went down, she slid out and then I wiped out as well on that corner. Oh, wow. So that was all part of the same crash, huh? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm just uh, some lowly newbie to the sport. So I was kind of, <laughs> and to be honest, she was like, she was very, she was really banged up and. Yeah. And I was relatively unscathed with the exception of my, my hand, which I just broke a little bone in my hand. So um, that maybe wasn't ideal leading into Kona. Uh, <laughs> no, maybe not ideal in inverted yeah, commas. <laughs> so it's, but I said, well, I'll just make do. And, and so the swim was the only part where I, I was really affected by it. Um, and then, yeah, sure enough, I had I ended up getting two flats on the day and and fixed one and, and waited for, I had to wait for the wheel support for probably about an hour total on the side of the road. So, oh, no. and that was my first one, but you know, I couldn't, I knew during that race, I said, I've got to finish, you know, I can't, this is my first Ironman. I'm in Hawaii. Like you can't, you can't drop out. So, uh, so yeah, I stuck it out on the marathon and, and actually, um, to this day, that's probably still my most, well, easily my most successful Ironman. So I, I ran really well the last 10K, and that, that kind of gave me hope. I said, oh, you know, everyone says Kona's awful. You know, I said, oh, it's not so, but, you know, it's first one. It's <laughs> so if I take the flats away, it was a decent day. But 
uh, I think it would probably help. I went in there pretty naive and I didn't really know what to expect, which I guess going into an Ironman maybe is a good thing to a yeah. certain extent. So. Yeah, yeah, maybe. And then you've got that, that awful was... thing where having had a good marathon in your first race, then like the Ironman gods probably pay you back a few times <laughs> in the next races, right? Yeah, maybe. I Well, I mean, I, I had a bad patch in the middle, but just the fact that I ran well in the end, yeah, that kind of gave me hope for, for the future. And I didn't do another one until uh, 2015. Let's see. Yeah, so four years later. Is that right? Yeah, four years later uh, when I did I, – I raced France, Ironman uh, Nice, and then Arizona that same year. And uh, and France was quite a shocker for me. I was I was having a great day through the, through the, the swim and the bike. And Yeah, you were off the then, bike in fourth that day, right, if I remember right? Yeah, I was in fourth. I was kind of in second for a good bit of the ride and, and then uh, was running quite well, you know. You know, you hear this story a zillion times from people, but through about, you know, six, seven K and then all of a sudden, you know, I just completely deteriorated having stomach issues and, oh, and I had never up until that point, I'd never had any stomach issues like that before. And, and, you know, I'd always heard people talking about it and I was like, Oh, you know, I've never, you know, never had something like that, but it was totally, you know, I couldn't, you know, I was running maybe a hundred meters and I'd have to go to the bathroom again. So, yeah. uh, but it was one of those things where I, I, you know, I'd flown to France for this race, um, and and I, yeah, I wasn't going to drop out, so I ended up essentially walking 30k uh, of the marathon, and it was about five and a half hours on the run. And that's hard in France, man. There's, there's nowhere to hide, and the, the run is no, there. There's nowhere no, to no, sneak I mean, in. You're right on the spectators, and and uh, I remember there was one woman that was standing on the side, and. And I came around uh, the first time, you know, they were cheering and, you know, they reading your name off. And, and then the second time, I remember, you know, I'm still walking here. And she's like, I'm still here. I said, you better come around the next time. And kind of <laughs> laughing almost. And I said, OK, well, I'll, I'll be back. It might take me a while. But um, so it was a long day. But I think I learned some some good lessons from that. And and hopefully uh, when I when I race my next one, I'll I'll have that piece figured out. So. Oh man, I feel fear. Well, it's. I think there'll be a lot of listeners taking heart from the fact that you've got the same story as them. That sometimes you have a great marathon, and other times you get an upset stomach, and you can't really work out why. And it's just trying right. to put the pieces of the puzzle together, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's a pretty. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty humbling thing when you when you get whacked like that. I mean, you can't. You know, you can only fake it so much with those stomach issues. I mean, it's. Yeah. yeah it stops you in your tracks. So. Yeah. I had the uh, same exact experience. It was my a rude last time, man. It's not pretty, is it? Yeah. <laughs> and it's awful because it's like in your head you're still chasing a time and you want to run like mm. seven minute twenty miles or whatever, and and your mm-hmm. brain just going, "Come on, we can do this." And your body goes, "No, no, you can't. Yeah. No, you're going to go find yeah, that no, bush and no, you'll no, stay no. there for seven more minutes." And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there were only about uh, two porta potties on that whole loop, so that was a it was a painful uh, walk around there for me, but. Oh. Um, you know, I mean, they, they appreciate it. I think the, you know, the race organizers when I crossed the line, I mean, they, they were happy that I kind of stuck it out and, and, uh, you know, I think it looks good. You know, a lot of, I'm not saying it was the right decision. Uh, I guess for me, I, I would prefer to, to finish any race if I can. Um, you know, I know a lot of professionals will drop out looking to another race because it, I mean, that's still, it's a long day. And, and if yeah. you're, if you're well out of, you know, the money or the points or whatever you're chasing, then, you know, maybe look to another day. But, um, yeah, I just, I don't know, something about me. I'm just stubborn. But <laughs> if I can get across the line, I'll get across the line. <laughs> Good, man. So. I love it. I love that. So let's go Let's go back to 2012. You had a great year because you had, you had five amateur wins that year, didn't you? And it was, and I'm guessing that was probably the season where at the end of that you had a look and thought, right, well, I've run, I've won five races this year, then, mm. you know, it's, it's time to kind of make the decision and, and go pro. Yeah. So, yeah. So after 2011, I could have taken my pro card after that year. Um, but just thought, you know, I hadn't won, I hadn't done the big age group races in the States. You know, I wanted to, to do age group nationals, which is sort of, I would say the probably the most competitive age group race in the U S. Um, so yeah, so 2012 was, it was a great year for me and and um i think i needed that just to show yeah i guess to to show myself that i you know could could win some of the bigger races and and just compete with the the best amateurs out there and i said you know if you can't 
if you can't win age group races, then you're certainly not going to jump up to the pro ranks and, and, uh, you know, just be winning the pro races. So, um, yeah, I think Buffalo Springs obviously was my big win that year that, um, where I just nipped, uh, Michael Lovato by a few seconds who was in the pro race. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I had a great year where everything was just kind of ticking along and, and certainly, you, you know, you win a few races and it, it helps your confidence going to the next one. And, um, so I, I did my first pro race, actually the end of that, end of that year, uh, it was a half Ironman distance race, uh, called Rev, one of the Rev three tri series okay. back then. Um, so that was, I think October of 2012. Um, and actually my first injury in that race, ironically. So I, I got a stress fracture during the run, oh, uh, wow. of that race. Yeah my first first pro race so um and then yeah 2013 was kind of my first i guess my first full year that i would consider so well that was going to be one of my questions i think really obviously coming from a coming from a i don't want to say no impact because obviously the the cross-country skiing thing it has got some impact but it's got nowhere near the kind of physical impact that running would have on your body so i guess like in some ways you've saved your body all of that all of that impact growing up that someone who's been a you know a runner or a triathlete all the way through to the early 20s would have Mm -hmm. but in some ways are you finding that it took your body a while to adjust with like maybe a bone density thing and and the stress fractures were possibly a part of that do you think yeah i think up until 2011 you know i had never in my entire life i'd never run you know, consistently a full year. I mean, I'd never done it. So I, you know, I ran track and cross country, but I wasn't training the whole year. You know, I'd jump in and I'd be running in the fall and, and then I'd stop and, you know, do whatever else. So, um, I think part of it was, was just, yeah, I finally, you know, accumulated a year plus of running. Um, and I also just took, I kind of took it for granted that I was, I was never injured prior to end of 2012. I mean, I'd broken occasional bones, you know, from a fall, uh, but I never had any sort of, you know, running injury or stress fracture that had prevented me from, from training or racing. So you kind of take all the, I just, I never, it never even crossed my mind to think, you know, I need to be doing strength training and I need to be, you know, stretching mobility work, whatever. I mean, I just, you know, I said, oh, I'll swim, bike and run and, and it's all good. Yeah. Um, and so you're that, bulletproof I until that, you need to bullet, right? <laughs> That's, yeah, so I think that that injury or that first stress fracture I had kind of uh, opened my eyes a bit, and and I didn't really have it properly diagnosed for a month and a half or so until I had an MRI, and and coming back from that, it, it took me about six months before I was racing again. Um, I guess my first year as a professional, so um, I, I certainly don't don't take it for granted now when I'm healthy and and. Uh, yeah, that just showed me, I think, that I needed some more. Yeah, I think just, you know, as you accumulate those consistent years of running, it all it all starts to add up and just making, you know, you're more durable. And and um, I guess, I you know, it probably was going to happen sooner or later. Um, but, uh, yeah. Maybe you've managed to, uh, to increase the length of your career in the long run by having those injuries relatively early doors, I guess, huh? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so I had, you know, I had one in, uh, one in 2012 and then I had one again the following year early in 2014. So, um, at that point I was thinking I was just going to keep getting them every year, but, um, no, I think it did. Yeah, I guess it, it made me, uh, it's like fingers crossed touch wood, isn't it? <laughs> you don't want to say yeah, it in case. <laughs> I, I don't really jinx it. I mean, as I'm sitting here, you know, semi injured now, so. <laughs> um, no, but it, um, yeah, it just, uh, I guess made me thankful when I'm, when I'm healthy and kind of raring to go. And, and, and I do sort of think about all the little things just to stay healthy and, and to, uh, keep your body and, and everything moving. So, well, let's talk a little bit about that then in terms of, in terms of things that people who are listening can pick up from you, what do you think are some of the good habits that you've developed maybe as a consequence of having been injured, maybe not even because of that. What are some mm. of the good habits you think you've got into over the years that have helped get you where you are? Uh, I think one of the things I've always been, been quite good at is just, uh, you know, I've always been fairly self-disciplined and in, in whatever it is I'm doing, you know, you know, growing up and, and I would say more so now, but, but just having the, 
you know, the consistency I think is, is massive for, you know, for me and, and I think for anyone, um, you know, looking to improve and, and, uh, certainly stay injury free is just, you, and I know people say this all the time, but, but not doing anything totally crazy, you know, where you're flogged for four days, but just kind of ticking through the days and, and, uh, you know, it's maybe not doing anything special each day, but you're just sort of maintaining that consistency every day. And, and I've usually, you know, sort of prided myself in my consistency when I'm training and, and sort of, um, you know, clicking off the weeks. And I think that's when, um, you know, you'll end up finding the most success when, you know, all of a sudden you look back and you say, Oh, I've been, you know, I've been fairly consistent for the last three months. And that's when, you know, certainly for me is that's when I've always been in my best shape is, is when I've had that consistency and, and with no little blips or, 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 you know, things like that. So, yeah, 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 sure. And in terms of like nutrition and the things that you eat and the way you look after your body that way, I'm imagining growing up with Dave Scott as a dad, you, you had a fairly unique set of like nutritional <laughs> things going on at the family dinner table. It wouldn't be like you were, you were eating out at Kentucky Fried Chicken every third night. So do you think you picked <laughs> up some good habits there just as a, a virtue of growing up in that kind of household? Yeah, I think I, you know, I never was sucking down pop tarts and Fruit Loops when I was a kid. More so, they just weren't in the house. But yeah, um, so I, I guess I, I got just got used to eating a fairly you know healthy, uh, balanced diet. So for me now, it's it's relatively easy for me to to continue to do that, just because I never had those kind of things. I mean, I I definitely remember as a kid sneaking away to friends' houses just to get some junk food, you know, and um, but. Uh, I kind of always give my dad a hard time too, because as I've grown up, you know, I've kind of, I, in a way, at least when I was younger, my diet shifted as he sort of was picking up on the newer, uh, I guess the newer science or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, so when I was really little, you know, I'm having fat free milk and then, uh, you know, then soy milk, you know, it's just, yeah. uh, yeah, it sort of changed as I was growing up. Um, but I, I'm not overly, uh, you know. I'm not too over the top with my diet. I mean, I, um, I get in this conversation with my dad all the time about, uh, you know, he's, he's always trying to read up on the, the latest, uh, yeah, science behind, you know, there's all sorts of diets out there. And, and, um, I guess for me, I've just tried to keep it relatively simple and what's easiest. I mean, I think a big thing when you're, when you're racing and traveling all over the world is, is it does help to be a little bit flexible and, and what you're eating, you know, sometimes you end up at, yeah, I don't know, you know, you don't know where you're staying and, and you can't always get access to that one, whatever, one brand of food that you want to eat, that yeah. you eat in Boulder or whatever it is. So <laughs> you got to be a bit, uh, yeah, a bit flexible with that. I think it makes life a little, little easier. <laughs> yeah, it, it's cracking me up actually thinking um, your story about Ironman France and how right by the finish line of Ironman France, there's that McDonald's. And okay. there's the, you know, what I'm talking about the line on the finishes yeah. day, like the line of people still in the triathlon kit have gone straight over, and it's just like, yeah, yeah, everyone's having a complete breakdown and going, I just need to eat something now. And, yeah, I mean, I think everyone, you know, I'm not, I don't eat a some perfect diet every day, so I, you know, I have my vices for whatever it is, you know, burger or some sweets or whatever. Um, but I, I'm not, I'm not too over the top with it, and yeah, uh, you know. You, uh, I think if you're trying to eat healthy most of the time and, uh, do something that you can, you know, consistently, then that's better than trying to be, you know, super anal for two weeks. And next thing you know, you're, you're just binging on McDonald's for yeah, another man. week or something. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, listen, yeah. we've we've touched on your dad a couple of times. Then. I didn't want the, mm. the interview to become about him, but I wanted to get a sense of how it was for you. I mean, I, I don't know what the age is relative to when your dad was racing and stuff like that, but did you get to go over to Hawaii and watch him race when you were little? Yeah, so I went over there, I think, I want to say three times when he was still racing. Uh, I was quite young, um, 94. You know, I was So I went over there when I was three, five, and then I think nine, and he'd raced all those years. Um, wow. when I was, you know, three and five, I wasn't, you know, too concerned about the Hawaii Ironman. I was you just in holiday with, working, with your mom, right? Yeah. I just, you know, I was just hanging out on the beach with my mom and, and, uh, and I didn't really know what was going on with the race. Um, when I was nine, certainly I was, you know, more aware of, of what he was doing. Um, but even then, and I, I remember that year more and, and I remember seeing him come out of the swim and, 
onto the bike and I remember we watched him, you know, head up Polani Hill there and then that's that's it. That's all I saw of the whole race, you know. Then we were at the beach for the rest of the day. So, right. It's not exactly um, a spectator sport, is it? I suppose no, if you're actually there in the flesh. There. Um, but uh, so yeah, I was I had, you know, I've been on the island several times before, you know, going there in 2011 when I raced and and kind of getting to see what it's like, but I never really had a real vivid memory of it when I was little. Yeah. Um, just of what sort of the race atmosphere and um, and what that's like, you know, the the week leading into Kona, which I was pretty shocked when I went there in in 2011. Just just the whole scene surrounding the race is is kind of unlike any other race you'll ever go to. So. <laughs> a lot of compression gear going on. <laughs> yeah, a lot of compression gear, and and I just remember one morning when I I went out to run on Elite Drive, and, and I thought I'd beat the crowd. It, you know, it was six o'clock or something. And I said, oh, "I'll you know just go for a nice run on Elite Drive." And I walked out there, and it was like it was like a zoo. I mean, there were there were people all over the place running. I mean, it was it was crazy. So uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it turns Wild. into a madhouse for those seven to ten days. And do you think you ever had? Did you ever have like a little bit of a resistance for going into triathlon because? of who your dad was and like the being this on the one hand, obviously you've grown up around triathlon, but on the other hand, you know, it's Dave Scott, that kind of thing. Was that right. ever part of the psyche for you? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I was never hesitant. Like, you know, when I was younger as a kid, I was never hesitant to do a triathlon because, Oh, you know, my dad's won Kona six times. It was more that I, you know, I was just involved in, in other sports and it just didn't really cross my mind to, that I'm going to yeah. race triathlons. I was just doing other things and, and, you know, my dad was happy to see that I'm active in sports, of course, but he was never, you know, pushing me into, Oh, you know, you should try triathlons and, and, give it a go. So it wasn't until I really decided to get yeah, to, to do that one in high school when I sort of, you know, it was just something different from what I'd been doing. Um, growing it up. It seemed like you, you tried it cause it seemed like a fun thing to do rather than because it was like the family yeah. business, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, it was my decision. I mean, as I said, I, I mentioned, or I volunteered at that race uh, a year prior to doing it. And yeah, I, I really just decided that year. I said, "Oh, you know, I'm sign up for the Boulder Peak and and uh, you know, see what happens." So yeah, no, he was yeah, he kind of let me do my own thing and 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 uh, yeah, it's always kind of been like that. Nice. And I, I always ask pros when we get them on, and neo pros especially, how is it for you in terms of like making a living as a triathlete? How how easy or hard is it these days to kind of pay your way and and actually make a living doing what you do? Uh, I think it's. I think it's definitely gotten gotten harder in the last, you know, even the last three to four years. Um, when I started, you know, I, I was really fortunate my first few years as a pro that uh, I think it, it definitely helped me. You know, I had a great final year as an amateur and, yeah. and I had a lot of publicity, you know, and whether that, you know, I did have very good results, but, uh, you know, I know my last name probably didn't hurt at the time <laughs> and, and I'm not one to, to push that. I just, I don't, I don't like to do that, but yeah. Um, you know, I was supported quite well by a few few companies in my early years as a professional and was, you know, extremely thankful for that. And, and that sort of allowed me to to make the initial jump and, and maybe made it made it a bit easier for me at first to make that jump because it is a bit of a, an unknown. And um, but I think the race is now certainly the depth of, of all the races has increased. I mean, it's you know, there it's much quicker than it was even four years ago. So. Um, it's, it's definitely harder. You know, the races are only paying eight deep, you know, there might be 40, 40 people on the start line, mm. you know, paying eight deep. But the reality is, you know, if you're not top four, well, you're probably, you're probably not covering your expenses. So, yeah. um, yeah, that piece is harder and you have to sort of, uh, yeah, maybe be a bit smarter with, with races that you're choosing and, and, uh, you know, certainly the whole social media and, and marketing aspect, I think has become even you know, of more importance and, and, uh, yeah, company, you know, being on Twitter, Instagram, all the other social media channels is, is becoming, yeah, more and more important. Um, but, uh, yeah, you've got to be kind of smart with, with which races you're picking and, and which kind of suit your strengths. Um, well, let's give a shout out to some of your sponsors Anne, and get them some airtime because I'm a big believer in supporting the people who, who support the athletes. Who are some of the guys who are looking after yes. you at the moment? Uh, so Hoka One One, I've been with them since uh, 2014 and they've, they've been one of, my, one of my big supporters of the last few years. And, and the, that was sort of the first shoe I tried after my last stress fracture in, in 2014. And, 
And uh, so for me, I was, it was easy to, you know, to convince me to, to wear those shoes, you know, after I've strung together a few seasons now and, and stayed healthy um, with, with no running injuries. So, Do you know, the number um, yeah, of people they, who try hookers and, and they've been injured and they try them and they're just like evangelical about them. Yeah, you know, even well, at the age no, group level, honest, like, have you tried hookers? Try the hookers. <laughs> I mean, yeah, knock on wood, but no, I, I haven't. Yeah, I've never been injured, uh, at least from a running injury um, since I've been wearing hookers. So, um, yeah, they've, they've been great for me. And um, I've, I've also, you know, Blue 70 is, has supported me ever since uh it's really i started in triathlon so they remember they they uh you know they gave me a swim skin when i first did kona and and uh sort of been with them ever since so i um you know I, i'm i'm a fairly loyal guy and and i certainly appreciate you know uh people that have helped me out when you know it, it's easy to or easier i guess to you know to get support of these companies when you're winning all the races or you know yeah. you're on the top of the podium but you know when you have injuries or um, you know, go through a little, few ups and downs and, and then for the companies that still back you, you know, that, you know, it means a lot to me and, and it certainly, you know, I think gives you more confidence when you have these people that, that believe in you and, and, um, yeah, are allowing you to, to do what you love to do. So, um, yeah, that's cool, man. And listen, let's, let's just finish up with a, I was hoping we were going to time this, this interview with a real success story from Ironman South Africa for you, but it, it wasn't to be, unfortunately, was it? Can you, do you mind sharing the story of what happened there to you? Yeah, I, I'm sure it's, you know, it's probably dra- driving Matt crazy now. If I've only been working with Matt for about two, well, this is really my second, will be my second full year working with him. And, and, uh, I seem to have a bad, uh, I, I don't know. April hasn't been a good month to me over the years. Uh, <laughs> last year, I broke my collarbone in April, and uh, and then this year, yeah, I was I was planning to do Ironman South Africa, and and uh, the Monday prior to the race, it was a Sunday race. I I just was out for a, a you know a casual spin, and and I don't know what I was what I was doing, taking a drink of, of water or something, and and managed to hit some bump. Next thing I knew, I was sailing over my bars into some ditch on the side and, and, uh, just landed kind of most of the impact was on my back. And, and, uh, I thought I'd be okay. You know, I, I saw someone down there and, and was sort of managing things all right, um, for a few days and, and was able to, to swim and bike some, but, um, I just, I just wasn't able to run leading into the race and, and sort of up until the Saturday before the race, I, I finally, you know, I tried to go for a 200 meter jog and, and I couldn't do it. So I said, you know, 42 K is going to be wishful thinking. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was of course of, you know, extremely frustrating. I mean, more, I was just kind of kicking myself for, for crashing again. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, it turns out I, I've, I got an MRI once I got home and, um, have a few, uh, mild compression fractures in, in my spine. So it was certainly oh, the wow. right call not to, not to start the race. And, yeah. um, but luckily, it's you know they're all stable, and so hopefully I'll heal up relatively quick. And and uh, you know I guess the, the good news for me is is I've come back from from many injuries before, and um, you know I've essentially had one. I'm not trying to make it a routine, but almost every year that I've raced as a pro, I've had you know a fairly significant injury that's taken me a few months to build back. So um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's frustrating as any injury or sickness is for for people, but. Um, I'm pretty confident I'll, I'll be back out there, you know, you middle what, of the season. So thank the Lord you didn't start the race, man, because it had been easy to kind of muscle through and then you'd have done yourself some real damage with spinal compression yeah. fractures and trying to yeah. run that, wouldn't you? Hey, yeah, it's one of those things, you know, leading into the race to, uh, you know, you're always thinking, and even after I didn't start that morning, I'm still thinking, you know, could I have raced, you know, and, and should I, you know, should I be out yeah. there? Am I really injured? It was almost, yeah. So it was a tough, yeah, a tough call to make. But in the end, it, yeah, definitely the right call. You know, if it was an Olympic distance, I thought well, maybe you could hobble through a 10k run. But uh, a 42k is hard one to <laughs> to yeah. muster. You got to look after your spine, man. You only get one yeah, of them. Ex- exactly. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, but. And what, will the, what will the rest of the season look like in in a perfect world? You heal up from this. What's your what's your target race going to be to to head across the summer yeah so i'm kind of you know obviously having to be be flexible with this and and change things up um i'm hoping i can be back racing you know end of june 
Um, I was going to do Ironman Boulder this year, the hometown race, uh, early June, but that's probably a bit tight uh, at the moment. So uh, I'll have to kind of look at, you know, there's there's plenty of options. It's, you know, the good news is it's early and, uh, you know, June to December now, there's there's zillions of races. So uh, I'll, I'll definitely look. Uh, I'm eager to race the Ironman distance again. Um, you know, Come I, and race I Ironman UK. It. Come and race over here with us, man. Maybe, Stay yeah, with us. Know, that's, a, that's, that's a tough course, isn't it? I've, oh, yeah. I have always followed that race, and it's... You'd it's love always, that course, man. There's not, yeah, a, there's not it a, looks, 100 meters of flat on the whole bike course. Right, it's all no, like that. It, it's brutal, huh? Yeah, so um, we'll have to see. I mean, I, I'll uh, I'll find find something at the end of the year, but, but definitely targeting uh, an Ironman race at some point this year. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hungry to do one, and... And I, I need to redeem myself after those last few. So, <laughs> um, but we'll have to see. Yeah, nothing. I'll probably race 70.3 Worlds, I think, in in Chattanooga this year. Uh, I haven't I haven't done a World Championship yet, um, so it, it's uh, you know it's relatively close. And um, yeah, it'd be good to to jump in one of the big races and and see how I go. You gotta so. do it when the World Champs are in your comp in your country. It'll be yeah, a bit well, of home actually, support, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, it's it's in Chattanooga, so out east a little bit. But uh, yeah, I think it'll be you know it's, it's a good opportunity when when it's close. And next year, I know it's moving to South Africa, so back in Port Elizabeth. Um, so we'll we'll see. But uh, yeah. yeah. All right, man. Listen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It's been a great interview, and I've loved hearing your story. And I'm sure all of our listeners wish you well with recovery from the injury. And uh, we hope to see you racing over here at Ironman UK or Wales sometime yeah, soon, buddy. That'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for having me on, Rob. I appreciate it. All right, man. Thanks very much. And there we have it. It'd be great if Drew came and raced in the UK. I was trying to encourage him after the interview, Hells, to come over and had, had such a good laugh. I was like, you can come and stay at my house, mate, if you race at Bolton. <laughs> But well, yeah, we're only wearing down the road. Exactly. Yeah. Come and stay with me, mate. He's like, Oh, I might do. When is it? Oh, it's too early. So uh yeah, so get well soon, Drew. It was a nasty accident you've had recently and um hopefully you'll be back to full strength and full power before too long, eh? Yeah, definitely. Cool. And that pretty much brings us to the end of this week's show. So thanks for listening, everybody. Our sponsors have been precisionhydration.com tgstore.co.uk and wearetribe.co please go over there and check their stuff out and support the people that support the show and until next week Hells I hope to hear a story of you having had an open water swim on next week's show that'll be very amusing (laughs) yeah that one and having actually ridden outside on my TT bike with what how many weeks to go before the half outlaw you got three weeks yeah Yeah, something like that probably Probably maybe less probably about time to give it a try yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> all right brilliant right well till next week then when we'll be hearing stories of helen dodging traffic on a tri bike and dodging hypothermia in the water we've been listening to the oxygen addict triathlon podcast i'm coach rob Wilby. i'm helen murray and until next week have a great safe training and racing week and we'll speak to you again soon cheers see ya